Hi everyone, I hope you're all well. So we all know that Australia and America are close allies. There are many similarities between our two great nations, like our shared ideological split over the wholly contentious topic of Taylor Swift. However, we also have a number of differences, like Australia's favourite national condiment, Vegemite, which is basically made of salt and yeast, but still tastes amazing, versus American peanut butter, which has more salt than Vegemite and has largely replaced peanuts with high fructose corn syrup. Then, of course, there is the weather. While the USA has a very distinct spring, summer, autumn and winter, with each season a precise three months long, Australia has nine months of summer, two months of slightly cooler summer, then one month of holy crap it's freezing even though it's only the same temperature as London in the springtime. And who could forget our wildlife? While the native animals in the USA are characterised by the gentle moose and the comical skunk going about their business and contributing to the delicate ecosystems in which they thrive, when it comes to Australia's animal kingdom, everything, literally everything, is trying to kill you. A huntsman spider has been caught on camera attempting to eat a possum. You heard us. The extraordinary photo, look at this, was taken in Tasmania, but it's not the only giant spider with an appetite for causing fear. Anyway, when it comes to Australian and American politics, there are some interesting comparisons to be made. At first glance, it seems that our political landscapes are vastly different. I mean, first and most obvious, Australia has a completely different system to the USA. We are a democracy, we're part of the Commonwealth, and as such, Queen Elizabeth II is our head of state. Therefore, our head honcho is a prime minister rather than a president, and also voting is compulsory. The USA is a federal republic in which the president, congress and federal courts share powers reserved to the national government according to its constitution. Voting is not compulsory and the people vote for a specific candidate instead of directly selecting a political party. Also, Americans have this thing called the Electoral College. This means that each state gets a certain amount of Electoral College votes cast by the state's electors. This is designed to protect the less popular states from being dwarfed by the interests of larger states, namely the ones on the coasts. As such, even if a presidential candidate wins the most votes, aka the popular vote, they may not end up the president because of the Electoral College. However, despite these vast political differences, I have noticed some rather bizarre similarities in our politicians themselves. It is a bit trippy, actually. So what I would like to do is to give you my four favorite political doppelgangers of American and Australian politics. President Donald Trump is a man who needs no introduction. Known for his America First outlook, strict stance on illegal immigration and unapologetic way of doing things, Trump shocked the world when he pulled off the ultimate upset victory in 2016 by beating Madame Megalomaniac herself, Hillary Clinton. He is also known fondly as the Donald, the God Emperor, or even just Daddy, and has coined more catchphrases that have made their way into popular culture than any pop culture icon I can think of. We're going to build a wall. We will have so much winning if I get elected that you may get bored with winning. Bing, bing, bong. Wrong, 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 wrong. Big league, big league. And that's what's happened, big league. High energy. Mr. Mr. Trump. Mr. Trump. Now, a question I get asked quite a lot is, does Australia have its own Trump? Well, up until very recently, I would have said no, not really. But then, our current Prime Minister Scott Morrison waltzed onto the scene. Now, at first glance, you wouldn't think this polite, Pentecostal, seemingly ordinary man was your Trump-esque kind of figure. But then he pulled off his own upset Trump-style election victory in May this year. He won our federal election against the predictions of every poll and against every media narrative out there. Now, Scott was the result of his party knifing a sitting Prime Minister in the back in the middle of last year, which understandably incensed the general public. Needless to say, it seemed the Liberal Party, which is our Conservative Party for anyone who doesn't know, was not exactly in good standing with the voters. But Scott Morrison, just like Trump and unlike the Democrats, got out there on the ground in the community and actually listened to the people he called the Quiet Australians. He made himself, for lack of a better word, relatable and didn't patronise ordinary people for not digging the hashtag woke narrative of the Labour Party. 
He also, like Trump, has unapologetically strong views on illegal immigration and masterminded what we call Operation Sovereign Borders, which prevents illegal immigrants coming by boat from gaining immediate access to Australia. Scott Morrison also has his own affectionate nickname, ScoMo. And while he's not known for quite so many catchphrases as Trump, he has publicized the slang, how good is? How good is Australia? <laughs> and how good are Australians? Perhaps then it's these similarities between the two world leaders that make the Donald and ScoMo get on so well. Adorable. The antithesis to Scott Morrison is former leader of the Labour Party, Bill Shorten. Bill led the party right up to this year's federal election, which obviously he lost in spectacular fashion and thus stepped down as leader. However, Bill for the last few years has been swanning around quite literally like he owns the place. He bought right into the media and social media narrative that he and Labour were absolute shoe-ins for government. For Hamish in the long course and I know I saw Hoppy down there, so great to have you here Hoppy. Very emotional today. The platform Bill ran on was very much in line with the woke climate change alarmism narrative that normal people just don't buy but don't talk about for fear of public ridicule. Nevertheless, Bill campaigned so hard on the renewable energy shtick that, even when asked a number of times, he refused to give the cost of his climate change plan. When can voters expect to learn more about Labor's uh, emission reduction target, how you're going to get there and the cost to the economy? In the two-minute answer that followed, not one reference to the emissions reduction target. Question, Mr Shorten. Oh, OK. Politicians not answering the question they get asked can get frustrating. I'm going to give someone else a go. Answer the question, I'm when Dan can people know? Dan. When can people know, Mr Shorten, the cost I'm, of the economy? You didn't answer the do question. you know what, John? I'm going to go to the no, next No, you should person. answer the question. That's why we're here to ask questions and you're not answering the question. Dan. When can people expect to know, Mr Shorten, the cost of the economy? All right, Dan. Why can't you answer the question, Mr Shorten? Because I'm going to give your colleagues half a go. No, because Dan. you should answer it. Why can't you answer the question, Mr Shorten? Obviously, your average voter is going to prick up their ears at that kind of stuff because greater government costs means higher taxes, which nobody with any sense wants to pay. And considering that Bill was honest to God refusing to say how much this plan would cost, we all assumed it would cost quite a lot. But because Bill Shorten had this kind of born-to-rule entitled attitude which was mirrored by the rest of his party, he thought the little people would just go along with it because that's what Twitter and The Guardian were telling him. Then, when Labour eventually lost, he and his party blamed literally everybody but themselves. They patronised those who didn't vote for them by saying they simply didn't understand Labour's grand progressive plans. They also insisted that the media was against them, which is, of course, a load of crap, considering how anti-liberal party and anti-conservative most journalists tend to be. So, consider this. Here you have an establishment politician from a left-wing party with a born-to-rule mentality who thinks he's entitled to the prime ministership. He runs on a radical climate change identity politics driven platform and patronizes anyone who disagrees with him. Then when he loses unexpectedly, he and his party blame a host of increasingly outlandish external factors rather than knuckling down and admitting that maybe, just maybe, their campaign wasn't very good. Now. Who does all of that remind you of? Yep, Bill Shorten is Australia's very own Hillary Clinton. The parallels between his story and persona and hers are quite uncanny. And that is why we call him Billary. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, nicknamed AOC, or as I like to call her, Red Cortez, is another one who really needs no introduction. Campaigning as a democratic socialist, Red is a climate change alarmist who regularly puts her foot in it in the media and on Twitter. She also proposed a Green New Deal earlier this year, the recommendations in which included getting rid of, and I quote, farting cows, and renovating every single building in America, including private homes, with or without the 
consent of the owners to make them more environmentally friendly. While we in Australia thankfully don't have any mainstream politician who is singing the praises of an all-encompassing socialist regime, we do have our own little climate change alarmist, identity politics pushing, gaffe making greenie in Sarah Hansen Young, whose name is also shortened to three initials. S-H-Y or Shy is our AOC. Shy is also known for publicly putting her foot in it. While AOC has raised a number of eyebrows with this rather sinister moral posturing. I think that there's a lot of people more concerned about being precisely, factually, and semantically correct than about being morally right. Sarah is known for believing a fictional television show called Sea Patrol was actually a very much non-fiction documentary about the Coast Guard all of which came out during the most unfortunate circumstances, a Senate estimates hearing. We have another television show, of course, about um, the Coast Guards. Uh, there does seem to be a little bit of a double standard here. Sorry, Senator, the TV show about the Coast Guards... Uh, is, sorry, is that the fictional Sea Patrol program? or I, I, I don't know which one you're talking about. Uh, in relation to fishing boats and, and so forth. Well, there's not much else you can say about that, really, is there? New York Senator and leader of the Democratic Caucus, Chuck Schumer, is one of the most irritating politicians in the world. He's one of those people who talks a lot but says very little, aside from flapping his hands while clinging to the moral high ground and compulsively tweeting about how much he apparently hates Donald Trump. He is really one of the most insufferably self-righteous people I have ever come across. Anyway, Chuck really caught my attention in 2017, just after Trump had instigated his travel ban with this moment of emotional incontinence. This executive order was, was mean-spirited and un-American. But as it turns out, Australia has its own version of the perpetually moralizing and insufferable Chuck Schumer in left-wing darling Richard Di Natale. They even look kind of alike. Now, Richard is the leader of the Australian Greens, a minor party that is best described as somewhere to the left of Bernie. Richard is the quintessential example of someone on the regressive left who is quick to condemn any kind of tiny transgression, however out of context, in his political opposition, but is perfectly happy to excuse even worse behaviour if it comes from his own side. Like the time just before the election when he did not denounce his Greens candidate for the Northern Territory, George Hanna, who called Liberal candidate Jacinta Price, who is Indigenous, a coconut. Now this is an appalling racial slur and implies that the recipient is black on the outside but white on the inside. It is similar to calling a conservative woman an internalised misogynist. But I guess, according to Richard, racism is okay when it's directed at conservatives. Anyway, Richard is one of those lefties who goes on and on about so-called hate speech, which really just means speech he doesn't like or speech that is critical of his politics. He drew some ire in May, again just before the election, when he suggested that there should be gag laws on the media. We're going to call out the hate speech that's been going on. We're going to make sure that we've got laws that regulate our media so that if people like Andrew Bolt and Alan Jones and Chris Kenny and I could go on and on and on. If they want to use hate speech to divide the community, then they're going to be held to account for that hate speech. This attitude is worrying for obvious reasons, but I can pinpoint exactly where it came from in this instance. A week or so before Richard made these comments, he had appeared on Andrew Bolt's show, The Bolt Report, and attempted to accuse Andrew and the right generally of hate speech. And that encounter did not go well for Richard. When you came well, in here, now... did you go through bollards, right? Who put the bollards up and for why? When you came here, did you see the security guard? Do you know why we have to have them here? For the kind of people that you encourage. Do you know why I've had extra security in my home? Can people you encourage. Do you know why I was attacked in the street? Because of the people you encourage. Now, I think you should stop this poisonous rhetoric of hate, putting people's lives in danger, and look for the middle ground. Considering the thorough thrashing he received at the hands of Andrew Bolt, it is no wonder that Richard would like laws instigated to block Andrew's speech. Ooh, 
burn. Well, there you have it. Australia and America's political doppelgangers. Let me know what you think of this video. If it gets 5,000 likes, then hey, maybe I'll do some more Australia versus America content. If you liked that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment, and if you really, really liked it, then check out the video description for my Subscribestar link and other ways you can support me. Thank <laughs> you.